how to restart your fitness journey. We got five don'ts and we got five do's. Now, when it comes to bad news first, good news first, I'm always the type of person that's like, I want to eat the veggies first. Give me the dessert after. So we're going to go veggies first. Do not do these things if you want to have a successful diet, a successful diet, a a successful, sorry, tripping over my own words, a successful fitness journey. And before we dive into this, I just want to sit, like set the frame here because what I'm going to say is going to trigger some people. It's going to set off that mental resistance. That's like, but that worked for me in the past. Like, uh, why shouldn't I do that? It clearly works. And I'll say this, let's just quickly open our minds a little bit and adjust our definition of what works a or what a successful diet is or a successful fitness journey. A success w- in my eyes would be something that allows you to stay lean, to stay strong, to feel energized every day of the year for years to come. Not I hop on it, look my absolute best for about a month or two and then hop off it and I'm right back to square one. So this is all geared towards a long-term approach. That's what we want to start getting in the habit of is getting away from these all or nothing diets, these crash course 75 hard, got to prove to everybody how tough I am. No, this is the approach that you can do with relative ease and live your best life. So first and foremost, on the do nots is we're going to stay with the mental theme here. First is don't beat yourself up mentally. If you're in a place right now where you just are not happy and sorry guys, one sec, just making sure we're good on everything here. Uh, (laughs) This is what happens. We podcast and little notifications pop up, throws me off. Anyway, back, bringing it back, bringing it back. Uh, Don't beat yourself up mentally. Because, yes, it's normal to feel really crappy about yourself. It's normal to feel like, oh, I ate and drank so much. I feel like a slob. I feel like, a, as my dad would put it, a lazy sack of shit. <laughs> um, but that is not an excuse to just jump in and be like, screw it. I'm going to work out every day as hard as I can. I'm going to run until I can't feel my feet. I'm going to starve myself by eating nothing but salads every single day. That stuff, yeah, it works in the short term. It can help you look incredible, but it never lasts. It always results in regaining the weight and regaining more weight than when you started. So if you do want to put a lot of effort in and suffer a whole lot for very short term results and ending in a worse place than when you started, do that. But if you don't, avoid it. Next is hopping on a 1200 calorie diet. For if you're in a place right now where you were just eating in a caloric surplus, which means that you gained a little bit of weight over the past month or two, then your metabolism is fired up right now. It does not need to drop down all the way to 1200 calories to start seeing results. And unless you are a person that is around 120, 140 pounds, yes, maybe. But if you're not, then you can bet that you don't need that many calories. Or sorry, you can bet that you don't need to go that low in calories. So for if you're wondering what a good calorie intake should be, I mean, I've talked about it in many, many episodes. Hopefully you guys remember, but as a quick refresher, Take whatever weight that you want to get to right now and then multiply that by 10 to 12 and do it based on your activity level throughout the day. So if you work a job where you're sitting down a lot and you don't move around and you're not good about getting your steps in, then multiply it by 10. So let's say you're about like 180 pounds and you want to get to 160. Good. Multiply that by 10, 1600 calories. There you go. Or let's say you do move around a lot. You're on your feet a ton. You're in like a warehouse job or you're doing meetings on your feet all day, or you're like a personal trainer and you're just like walking around with clients all day, showing houses or something. That would be a case for multiplying by 12 because you are going to need more calories than a person that doesn't move as much. And if you are unsure and you're kind of somewhere in the middle, multiply by 11. And I can almost guarantee you that that will not give you 1200 calories. And if it does, don't go that low that fast. <laughs> like cap it 
at about 10% of your body weight. So myself, I'm 200 pounds, 10% off would like be 20 pounds off. So that would put me at 180. So 180 times 10 for the easy math, that'd be 1800 calories right there. Bing, bang, boom, easy way to do it. Next is cutting out specific food groups like the low carb crowd, the low fat crowd. They are adamant and they'll talk and scream until they're blue in the face about why their approach is best. But the hard truth of the matter is that it doesn't hold any water. When you look at the studies, when you look at like people that have done it, it is no better than doing a balanced approach. And in more times than not, the balanced approach results in people feeling better, getting better results, and having longer lasting results than these drastic approaches. And when we're talking about low carb, if you're looking for horrible feeling workouts and really low energy throughout the day, do that. Or if you're looking at low fat, for example, if you want to show up to your doctor and have your hormones all out of whack, or if you want to also feel like garbage, because fat is very, very important when it comes to hormone production and all of that, it's going to put you in a worse spot. And when your hormones are out of whack, it's that much harder to get a body composition that a lot of people are striving for to get leaner and burn that body fat. So for example, like let's say you did go low fat and it did mess you up a little bit hormonally and you're not in that good place, you'll lose weight, but a lot of that will end up being lean muscle mass or lean body tissue like bone, ligaments, and all that, not body fat. So you're going to lose weight, but you're going to look exactly the same. So you'll be a smaller version of your same body composition, if that makes sense. Uh, next is don't do seven days of grueling workouts. If you haven't touched a weight or gone for a run or gone for a swim in the past like two, three months for a consistent amount of time, like four, five, six days in a row consistently, your body is nowhere ready for that. It's nowhere near ready for that. And it's a whole, again, a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of suffering for very little added benefit and a much faster plateau. Uh, yeah, that's all I can say about that. It's going to be a shock to your system in the worst way possible because there's no way in like, especially if you're a normal person and you're not able to get perfect sleep every night, your nutrition is not on point. Clearly, you're not going to be able to recover from that and adapt in the way that you want. So the results are not going to come the way that you think they are. And Number five on the don't list is multiple workouts a day. This goes out to all the people that I love from the gym that I used to work out at. There was a solid group that would do our fat blast class multiple times, like in a row, like for three hours straight. And as trainers, we told them, we're like, you know, this really isn't good for you, right? Like this isn't a good idea. This is not something that's going to get you more results. It's just, if anything, it's killing your recovery. It's there's, it's not even so much as, oh, do it. It's not a big deal. It's don't do it because it's hurting you more than it's helping you. So if you're planning on doing like a body pump class in the morning, going for a run during lunch, and then catching a kickboxing class at night, that is one of the worst things that you can do for the same reason as the seven days of grueling workouts. There's no way your body's going to be able to recover from that especially for the average people out there that have kids, that have parents that they're taking care of, that have stressful jobs. Your body is never going to be able to recover from that optimally and get you really good results. So now that we've covered all of those, let's crank it up a notch. Let's get positivity going up in here. Let's do the things that you should be doing, the things that we want to start working on first and foremost to get you those results in the best way possible that you're going to be able to do with relative ease that are going to have you feeling freaking amazing. So first things first, get that sleep right. Yeah, you heard me. The one thing that nobody ever, ever wants to focus on when we're talking about getting back in shape, sleep. <laughs> Get those hours, that seven to nine hours of sleep. Now, I know that there are some women in their 50s and their 60s going, seven to nine hours? Are you freaking kidding me? I I hear you. <laughs> I, I work with many, many women in that stage of life. 
that just physically cannot get seven to nine hours. And also guys, like I've worked with many guys like that wake up going to the bathroom two, three, four times a night and it's just impossible to get seven to nine hours straight. Or new parents, like with young kids that are constantly waking them up at night. I know that seven to nine hours is a, <laughs> pun intended, a dream. <laughs> But that doesn't mean that we can't improve sleep and improve the quality of sleep. So let's say seven to nine hours is out the window. You get five hours right now and you have the bad habit of going on Netflix binges at night. Cut one episode. So say it's like 30 minutes. Cut that one episode out. You now have 30 more minutes of sleep. Do that for a week. See how you feel. If you start feeling better then do it again. See if you can cut down another one and then another one and see how that goes. And fair warning, you might feel groggier than when you get less sleep. And that's normal because your body's in a rhythm and you're introducing something new. And you're also allowing your body to feel that you are in sleep debt, which is all those missed hours that your body wants of sleep, like say an alarm clock and time didn't exist and you can sleep as long as you want you're not getting as much sleep as you would have in that situation and your body knows it and it wants it. So it's going to make you feel groggy and try and keep you sleeping longer. So don't think that more sleep is bad for you. It's a wake up call. <laughs> Another pun. It's a wake up call to let you know you need more. If you wake up feeling groggier on more sleep, get more and if you, wherever you can. And that could be in like, let's say you work from home and you have a little bit of time before the kids get home and you have a little break in work, squeeze in a nap. You can't make up for bad sleep, but you can bank uh, some time ahead of time with sleep. So if you know you're only going to get five hours tonight, but you could squeeze in a five and a half, or sorry, you could squeeze in a 30 minute nap, do that because then that'll be like you got five and a half hours of sleep. Not exactly the same, but better than not getting it at all. Uh, sorry, I could talk about sleep a lot, <laughs> but we'll cut it there. I hope that that was helpful enough. If you need something to really dial it in as far as the hours go and all that, I have a better sleep worksheet in the uh, Facebook group, so definitely check that out. But before we go to the next one, as far as quality goes, one thing I will say that can help tremendously, no matter how much time you're working with, no matter how much, like how crazy your schedule is, like travel, whatever, having a ritual helps tremendously. If you have a nighttime ritual, no matter where you are in the world, your body's going to get a signal to wind down and you'll knock out faster and you'll sleep a deeper quality of sleep than if you didn't. So pick like three to five things, like brush your teeth, do some stretching and then read a book or something like that or whatever three to five things you can think of that you already do, do them in the exact same order every single night right before bed and just watch. You'll start getting drowsier and drowsier because your body knows now's the time. Got to go to bed. Next is not workouts, not nutrition yet. We're talking steps. I feel like Allen Iverson right now. We're not even, we're not talking about a game. Talk about practice. We're talking about steps. Yes, steps are one of those things that get your body moving. They get everything going. And they start, if you start with this, it's one of those easy things that not only gets your body in that place where it's like, I'm ready for fitness. It's going to improve your cardiac health. It's going to get your joints nice and lubricated. It's going to do a bunch of good things, but it's also mentally going to put you in the place of, I'm a fit person. I do walks. I'm active. I'm healthy. And that feeds into everything else. So starting with steps is one of the best things you can do. And if you don't do any at all, and you really struggle to get a lot, the baseline that I would start with, like for a lot of people, this is very easy to achieve, is 5,000 steps a day. That's like the bare minimum. The lowest that you want to go is 5,000 steps a day. And just start with that. And then you'll be surprised if you only aim for that much and you get it by like mid afternoon, you're like, I could go for another walk. And then boom, you are at 6,000 steps. And then the next day you're like, oh, I want to get ahead on my steps. So I'm going to bank them early. And then you hit your goal by like 
middle of the day and you're like, oh, I could do even more. Now you're up to 7,500 steps and then 10,000 and then 15,000. It builds up. So start with a low goal and then crush it. Next is water. When we're talking about water, we want to aim for about half your body weight in ounces. Now, I wouldn't say do that right off the bat because you're going to be going to the bathroom a lot. Now, That's like the goal. That's what you want to get to, that upper end. So start wherever you're at right now. Just establish like some consistency. Say you only drink one coffee in the morning and then maybe a glass during the day. Fine. Do that cup of coffee, that glass, and then add one more glass. So one good rhythm to get into is having a glass of water with every meal. So say you do breakfast, lunch, dinner, do your coffee at breakfast, water at lunch, water at dinner. Boom. Then keep that rhythm. And now instead of a glass, do something like a blender bottle, like the uh, shaker bottles that I got here. Those are about 20 ounces. The standard glass is like eight ish, but up the size of the container. That way it's really not that big of a change. It's just, I have a bigger glass. And then from there, do your breakfast, lunch, dinner with the blender bottle. Then from there, do breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then start adding one that you carry around everywhere that you have at all times because the closer it is to you within arm's reach, the more water you are going to drink. It's just a fact because you'd be surprised how thirsty you get looking at your water over and over again. If it's out of sight, it's out of mind, which works very well with trigger foods, but you can flip that and do it for healthy habits too. Uh, Let's see. Next is whole foods, eating more of them in general. Now, the ideal upper end for this one is 80% of your food being whole foods. Now, what does 80% mean? Because that's the first question. Every time I give it to a client, they're like, so is 80% like, I don't really know how to conceptualize that. Does it mean I can have one cheat meal? Does it mean this? Does it mean that? 80% means every single meal that you have is pretty much all whole foods, but If you want to have, like, say you're doing breakfast, lunch, dinner with two snacks a day. If you want to have one of those snacks be a donut that is like 150 calories, do it. And then boom, that's about 80% of your food being good. And then that one donut. Um, Or say you're going out to dinner with friends and family and you're like, okay, I looked at the menu. I'm making a good choice. I'm going to get the salad or sorry, not the salad, the uh, salmon with veggies on the side. I'm good. And then somebody brings out and orders mozzarella sticks and you go, I'll have one or two. And you share the appetizer with them. That's good. You're still on track. That's 80% right there because the rest of your day was good except for those mozzarella sticks. That did not qualify as a whole food. So that's fine. There's still room for that. The goal is not to be perfect because perfect is prison. Nobody wants to eat perfectly all the time. It's just we're not in a world that allows for that. Like if we were cavemen and we only had whole food, yeah, we'd be able to stick to it. But we're in an ultra processed, super palatable world. You need to live a little. And now let's say you hear that and you're like, geez, I don't know if I could even get close to that much whole foods. Like I eat out pretty much all the time. Like everything I eat comes from a wrapper or a box. Totally fine. Just aim for one meal. Like start from the other end of the spectrum, which is try and just get one meal of whole foods. And for a lot of people, the easiest one to do is going to be dinner because we usually have the most control over that. So do whatever you do for breakfast and lunch. And then for dinner, aim to get a lean protein, some veggies on the plate, and then a complex carb. And for those of you that don't know complex, simple carbs, simple carbs are like starches and sugars. And then complex carbs are like uh, brown rice, sweet potato, all that whole green stuff, all that good stuff. So lean meat, veggies, and a complex carb. And then if you hit that and do that for the majority of the week, you nailed it. And then as you go on, try and do that for dinner and lunch. Pack yourself a salad or a healthy wrap or something like that. And then once you get good at that, then see if you can start doing a protein shake for breakfast because protein shakes are kind of like the loophole, like these protein, like muffins and pancakes that have a ton of protein, have a ton of fiber. I allow for those. So I would say, yeah, count them if there's fiber in there because that's really the real kicker is fiber. We want more fiber. We want 
all the vitamins and minerals and all the good stuff. So upping the protein content during breakfast could be a step in the right direction too. So start with that one meal, work your way up. Last but not least is the two to four workouts per week. Now, I got a lot of crap on this one for (laughs) when I put it on Instagram because for some reason, all these teenagers and 20 something year olds that think they're hardcore, it really hurt their ego when I said this. And the research, (laughs) researcher die crowd came out and said like, I don't think this is supported by research. And let me just say this. I am talking to people that are not working out currently right now. Anything that is better than what you're doing right now, like anything is better than doing absolutely nothing. So if you're getting two workouts a week compared to none, you are going to get incredible results, plain and simple. So aim to hit the gym or do an an at-home workout again. I've got a dumbbell one and a body weight one on the Facebook group. So it's in the show notes. Give it a click. Join the group. You'll see it. So no excuses. You have something to do. Uh, Aim to do that two to four times a week. Or another fun way to do it, especially if you're starting up, is go to the like Planet Fitness or any other gym and just give all the machines a whirl. Like do a set or two of everything and see how it feels like nothing crazy. Don't try and max out every machine, just enough to get the muscles working enough to feel the blood pumping, get that tight feeling, that tight feeling, the pump. And that's a good place to start. And then you could get a more structured program from there, but it's really just about getting the wheels turning, getting that momentum and building off of that. And that's where I'll leave this because That's the main goal here is get the wheels turning, build sustainable habits, get yourself going in the right direction, making sure that it's somewhat comfortable and easy to do because that's the stuff that we're going to not have to force. Like That's the stuff that is going to last a long time because let's face it, humans do what's easy. Humans do what's comfortable. So pick the option that feels that way, that's making progress, that's getting you closer to your goal, and then you could build from there. Don't beat yourself up right from the start and make it a negative experience. We want this to be as positive as possible. So I hope that you found this helpful. If you need any help with your fitness journey, make sure to reach out. I'm always here. I'm always available.